Thank you very much. I'm Mike. This is Phil. We're going to be your, your entertaining act for the morning here. And, uh, you know, uh, Phil, maybe you want to talk a bit about where we're, where we're heading. Yeah. So we're going to start off with a song because what we said in our title was we're going to explain climate change and aquatic invasive species in lively songs and a boring PowerPoint. Um, that was the original title, was Boring PowerPoints, because Mike had his, I had mine. Now we're, we're combining two boring PowerPoints into one super boring PowerPoint. And then we added the pop quiz part, and we discussed this earlier with Lynn that you don't tell people they're getting a pop quiz, but don't worry, all of you are going to pass, but we'll get to the quiz. But we thought we'd start with a song, and this is a song that was written by Bob Dylan, his words and melody, and we changed the title of it. And this was written back in 1964. And I want you to listen real closely to the words, and you tell me he wasn't writing about climate change. Okay? Come gather around people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown and accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone if the time to you is worth saving then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone for the climate sure is changing Come writers and critics who prophesize with your pens and keep your eyes wide, the chance won't come again. And don't speak too soon, for the wheel's still in spin. And there's no telling who that it's naming. For the loser now, the later to win, for the climate sure is changing. Come senators, congressmen, please heed the call. Don't stand in the doorway, don't block up the hall. For he that gets hurt will be he who has stalled. There's a battle outside and it's raging. It'll soon shake your windows and rattle your walls. For the climate sure is changing. mothers and fathers throughout the land and don't criticize what you can't understand your sons and your daughters are beyond your command your old road is rapidly aging please get out of the new one if you can't lend a hand for the climate sure is changing The line it is drawn, the curse it is cast. The slow one now will later be fast, as the present now will later be past. The order is rapidly fading, and the first one now will later be last. But the climate sure is changing. Hey, that was kind of fun. But now it's time for the first test. <laughs> so, well, actually, before we do, does that, anyone know what this is? I would beg to say that there's probably three generations alive today that don't even know 
what a test pattern is anymore. They've never seen it on television in those late hours, right? Um, but in uh, 2016, Yale University did a study across the country looking at society's uh, impressions, beliefs, and opinions about climate change. So I'm going to present a few of those results, and it'd be fun just to see how we feel about these same topics in relation to counties of Minnesota and country, uh, states across the country. So with that, the first question I have for you, and maybe you quickly show hands, how many people believe that global warming is happening? And I see a very majority of hands here. And let me explain this graph to you. The redder the color, the more people in that Yale survey agreed with that answer. So red is agree, blue is generally disagree. The country as a whole really agrees with that um, question. Here's a scale about that. So you know, more than 70% of people agree with that statement. So we're not different in this room from the nation in that regard. How many think it is caused by humans, if you can show your hands? Okay, and we have a mix in the room here, reasonably balanced. Huh. As a nation, we have disagreement and agreement across the country. We're not different in our opinions about that here in, in Pine River's gathering here today. Interesting. How many people are worried about global warming? I think there's quite a few hands there. What does the what does it look like around the nation? Quite a bit of folks are worried about um, climate change or global warming in interesting places especially. I'm looking down here in Florida, South Florida. Look at the Gulf Coast area, um, Houston area, and down here Corpus Christi area, New Orleans, areas that really experience you know, these very strong tropical storms on at least a seasonal basis. I'll give you one more. How many think it'll harm you personally? There's a small amount of folks that feel that, and that's true across the country in this survey as well. Folks don't feel that they'll personally be harmed by climate change. But again, look at these interesting areas, South Florida, South Texas, places around Los Angeles that have been burning um, with fire as well. And we've had some fire up in uh, the San Francisco area wine country recently as well. So you can sort of begin to see where folks are, are feeling the, the effects of climate change or see how it could possibly affect them. So just a quick primer about what is this global warming business all about? And this graphic here, quickly sh just run through this. You may be familiar with this, but the sun emits solar radiation. It comes through space, travels through space to us. It comes to our atmosphere. Some of it passes through and hits our planet, some of it bounces off. The atmosphere never hits our planet. Some of it comes through and bounces off of the planet and go back, radiates back into space. So you get some of this radiation that warms the Earth, and that's why it gets warm during the day and cool during the night, okay? No, no science there, uh, uh, difficult science there. But then the next part about this is really, uh, once that warming happens, some of that shoots back out into space. It's radiated back into space. Uh, and some of it is bounces off of the atmosphere and returns to Earth and kind of traps and, and gives us a, a, a climate that sustains us as animals and, and part of uh, the planet Earth's biota. Uh, and so it, that's a pretty important feature that we don't want to really get away from this, this effect. However, um, the nuance is that what causes that to bounce off of the atmosphere and back to Earth is generally driven by carbon dioxide. There are other compounds like methane and such that also contribute. But carbon dioxide is principally one of those drivers. And this is a graph of the level of atmospheric carbon dioxide measured by a number of means going back almost a, a, a half a million years, so quite a ways back in time. And uh, are, you, are you folks able to see there? I'm sorry about that. OK, thank you. So, you know, how many folks have seen Al Gore's uh, Inconvenient Truth movie, right? That came out a decade ago or something like that, so quite a few of you do. And this is the graph that Al Gore 
kind of used, and so he, he talked about the ups and downs, and when he got to this point, he climbs onto a scissor lift, right, and, and goes up in the air, and so I'll try and, try and mimic that here. So unchanged, generally, um, it's operated in this for half a million years in this fluctuating zone. We're now in this unprecedented level, so I'm gonna do my Al Gore now, and he goes, <laughs> right, and he says, okay, we're here now. Um, well, the truth is, we're no longer there. As of September of 2016, we're now up here. That carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have consistently been above 400 parts per million all year round. That's a, that's a new, unplotted, unprecedented level in a half a million years. And the reason that's important, again, is that we go back to that greenhouse effect where the the heat radiates off the planet, hits the atmosphere and comes back, trapping. <coughs> Our temperatures very strongly correlate to carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. So I hope that wasn't too much uh, to throw at you uh, and hopefully mostly familiar to you. And it's important to think about our place and really make the distinction between weather and climate, extreme weather and climate. By looking out our window, we cannot really make a judgment about climate change or not. Is today's lovely warm thaw climate change or is it just a weather pattern uh, or a weather event that we're seeing? It was the cold stuff we had in December evidence against climate change or just evidence of weather? And back in 2015, how many of you, like me, heard about the polar vortex for the first time. I was like, I never heard of a polar vortex, right? What is it? And, and here's an example of a worldwide projection of the deviation in temperature, how much different temperature was globally from the global average uh, temperature. And, and up here you can notice in northeastern North America, blue is really, really cold and red is warm. In very few exceptions, the planet was red, warmer than average, but here in New England, Northeast uh, Washington, D.C., Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, uh, colder than average. And, and so we had congressmen having snowball fights in Congress declaring that there is no climate change. I looked out my window, it snowed in Washington, D.C., and therefore there's no climate change. And the real fact of this is that that's an example of extreme weather. And when you step and look broader than just your, your uh, backyard and such, you begin to see the pattern here of warmer uh, everywhere with the exception of this small area of North America. So I wanna emphasize some examples again, how to differentiate weather from climate. And, well, here's some examples of extreme weather. We had a record ice out across Minnesota in 2010. So from the Iowa border, ice went off of our lakes in spring of 2010 in the course of a little over a week to the Canadian border. That's unheard of. That's usually a month long process. And in the course of seven to 10 days, the entire state was ice free. That's an example of extreme weather. In 2013, really cold winter, we, that's probably still fresh enough in our minds, ice out didn't happen until May. The governor's fishing opener over in Park Rapids, he had to, he had to motor around the edges of the frozen ice that remained on the lake in order to, to celebrate what is an annual fishing event and a, and a big celebration of our, our culture of fishing in Minnesota. Again, an example of extreme weather. But it's these patterns of ice cover duration, how long the ice stays on the lake through the course of the winter, um, a change in growing season days or differences in planting zones. These are evidence of climate change. In other words, we're able to, we're able to grow, grow plants here in Pine River that we've not been able to plant and, and grow in the past because our climate now is warm enough, our soils are warming up, our growing season's long enough, we can make that happen. That's an example of climate change, where the, the patterns of extreme events occur over and over again. Now, Mark Seeley's a really smart, uh, smart guy, a meteorologist, uh, retired now, I believe, with the University of Minnesota. 
he wrote the book on Minnesota weather, one would say, right, in his uh, Minnesota Weather Almanac. Here's some statistics from his 2006 book that the, the warming trend in Minnesota is more statistically evident in winter than in any other season. In other words, our, warmers, our winters are getting warmer and it really is that they're not getting as cold at night. All right? So we're not getting these boiling hot summers um, and we're not getting super, super hot days necessarily in wintertime. It's that our low temperatures are not as low. For the Twin Cities, the long-term average snowfall is increasing. So we're having uh, higher winter temperatures, greater snowfalls. Um, up till, uh, since 1885, records began in Twin Cities. The average was 45.8 inches of snow. The recent history, though, over the past 30 years, it's now another 10 inches. And getting at the patterns of climate change, the signals of, uh, that we see in patterns, five of the 10 warmest winters on record since 1895 have occurred since 1987, okay? You've got a, a, a hundred, over 100 years of, uh, of record there. Five of the 10 warmest have occurred since 1987. And only to, as a further evidence that climate is warming, we don't see the same, ex pattern of extreme cold events. Only one of the 10 coldest winters on record in the Twin Cities occurred in the past 40 years. So we're not seeing a similar accumulation of extreme uh, temp cold temperature events like we're seeing in the warm. And this poor guy, Mark, you know, climate statistics are changing so fast here in this recent time, he had to rewrite his book 10 years later. So I mean, it's, it's not because he's a greedy guy, but the data is changing that fast that it's affecting our norms our normal statistics. And climate change uh, is something that we're experiencing today. So that we're seeing it in the signals of temperature, we're seeing it in snowfall, we're seeing it in rainfall across the upper Midwest. This is uh, a graph of, of how much uh, rainfall events are increasing in frequency from the long-term average um, for different kinds of rainfall events. And this is across the Midwest. So. Ohio, say, to uh, Colorado, those kinds of things, and up to the Canadian border. You know, and you're seeing in every instance, this is uh, um, 60, the decade of the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, 90s, and 2000s in each of these uh, bars. And in each case, you see an upward trend in extreme stormfall, uh, rainfall events. So under an inch a day, you don't, you see a little bit of an increase. One to two inches per day, you see 13% increase today over what we had 40 years ago. 30% increase in the, the two to three inch rainfall events. And a 52% increase in the major storm events, three or more inches of rain in a storm event. So that's stuff that we're seeing today. So this is not predicting into the future. And we've seen that even more locally. So that's the Midwest picture. Now what's Minnesota showing us? And, and this is a, just each dot on this timeline from 1860 to uh, 20, you know, basically this is 2016, shows where we had a six inch rainfall event that covered more than a thousand square miles. So to put a thousand square miles in context, that's the size of Crow Wing County approximately. Okay, so the county that we live in or the county that we're seated in right now how many, six inches of rainfall falling in that, over that entire area or more, greater than six inches of rainfall. And look at the pattern. There were a few back in the 1860s, one in the eight, 19, late 1900s, maybe 1910, one over here in the late 40s, um, three of them it looks like, three or four in the 70s. Look at the clustering. This is that evidence that I'm talking about of trends. Each of these individually is an extreme rainfall event, but the pattern suggests these are be extreme rainfall events are becoming more frequent. And you're seeing that. This is uh, the June storm uh, in 2016, and the bluer the color, the heavier the rainfall event. Um, if I can trace Rowing County right there, we were part of that storm event, and again, it was a five to six inch rainfall event for us. It was huge, eight to nine inches over in Pine County. This caused the Willow River Dam to fail in the city of Willow River in uh, Pine County, this particular rainfall event. This is the June storm 
in 2012, four years previous, that blew out dams and roads in uh, the Duluth area, right? You might remember the news story of the, uh, the Minnesota Zoo getting washed out and uh, the polar bear nearly getting out of its, uh, its uh, cage, cage and the seals flopping down Main Street. So there's some certain things that we can reasonably expect to happen uh, from climate change. We're going to see changes in our forests, uh, mostly related to temperature. We're not going to be able to sustain our, our boreal pine forests, and that'll change over to things that favor more oaks, maples, and things to that effect. You know, while these examples uh, are, are extreme weather events, these, uh, the 1999 blowdown, this is an example of how you might end up having rather catastrophic change in forest cover. And what will come back is, will, will likely end up being the beginnings of change to that new um, forest type that will be um, habitable for uh, oaks and maples in a warmed Minnesota. But we're gonna see more fires and things to that effect as well. Between uh, 2006 and 2011, fires burned over 200,000 acres uh, if, of Minnesota forests. This is the uh, Pagami Creek fire. This fire moved 13 miles in one day. Okay? So that's the distance from what, uh, here to Pequot Lakes in one day, a fire front moving that far uh, in a day's worth of uh, uh, burning. That's just astronomical. We're going to see changes to our wildlife species. Our charismatic moose are going to become less abundant. We're already seeing severe declines in their populations. And the reason for that is, is multiple factors, um, you know, disease and parasites. And we could probably solve that back to that these animals are under stress. They're under physiological stress. Um, they're an animal that's built for uh, cold weather, excuse me. Um, and so a cold winter, our cold winter is becoming more warm. They're becoming physiologically stressed. And then lastly, we're going to see changes to our aquatic systems. If we're, Minnesota's 10,000 or more lakes, right? 11,682 fill something to that effect. We get a ton of lakes. That's what we're proud of. This is our, our identity, our sense of place. And uh, the ice fishing tournament gives us an example of that. Um, but we're going to see changes in the, in the limnology, in the hydrography of our lakes. Um, you know, more fluctuations in water levels, warming, uh, warming and more favorable for aquatic plant growth and, and algal growth. And then with that, uh, we should expect uh, that certain invasive species will thrive in that setting. So with that, I think Phil um, is going to talk to us a bit about aquatic invasive species. Thank you. So I don't know if you can see these, these cartoons here. The top one it shows an invasive carp, and he's got Minnesota on a stick, and he's saying, yum. So they're heading up the river, heading for Minnesota, trying to get here and in, in, infest our waters. Uh, the one on the left, it doesn't seem to be covered in our invasive species management plan. We've got a spaceship that landed. And over on the right, it says harmful invasive species, and it shows the emerald ash borer, which is going out after our ash trees, the Asian carp or the invasive carp, same thing, and man, uh, as far as uh, harmful invasive species. Uh, this quote, uh, aquatic invasive species, a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. That was actually a quote by Winston Churchill back in 1939 when he, someone asked him about Germany, so before World War II, and that was his quote about Germany, but I thought it's a great quote about aquatic invasive species as well as about climate change because we're talking about two big issues here, but these are actually problems that we know how to solve. We know what it takes to keep invasive species from moving around. We know what it takes to lower our carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. We just need to do it. There aren't many problems out there where we know what the solutions are. These are problems that we know what the solutions are, and we just need to do it. Oh, I went backwards. So the definition of invasive species. This is legalese in Minnesota statute. And what it basically says is that invasive species come from somewhere else. They're not from Minnesota. They've come from somewhere else, and they're causing harm. It can be harm to the environment. It can be economic harm, or it can be harm to human health. So they come from somewhere else, and they're causing harm. So let's talk about pheasants. 
Does anyone know if pheasants are native to Minnesota? Show of hands, who, do you, who thinks pheasants are native to Minnesota? The few? Who thinks they're non-native, they came from somewhere else? That's right, they came from somewhere else. Does anyone know where they came from? I heard China. China is right. They were brought here to the States, I think in uh, the uh, 1881, they were brought to the U.S. from China, and they were introduced in Minnesota in 1916. So they are not native, but they are non-native. So they are non-native to Minnesota. They weren't originally here. They were introduced. Are they invasive? I'm seeing mostly no's. That's right. They're, they're not invasive because they don't cause harm. In fact, with the purchase of hunting licenses, guns, ammunition, guides, appropriate clothing, training for dogs, accommodations when you're out hunting, it's actually created a positive impact to the Minnesota economy to have pheasants here, and they don't seem to outcompete other species in that same habitat. There are lots of examples of non-native species here in Minnesota that do no harm. Um, rainbow trout, and brown trout. They are not native to Minnesota. Rainbows were introduced here uh, from the western states, and brown trout were brought here from Germany. It's another non-native species that isn't causing harm, so they're not invasive. It's only invasive when they cause harm. Uh, I've got a, an old friend who just retired from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and he used to say that non-native species are entering all the time. They're coming into the United States, they're coming into Minnesota, they're coming all the time, but only about 10% are able to est get established and become non-native. Now, of that 10% that's able to get established, 10% of those become invasive. So we're talking about relatively few number of plants and animals that come in that actually become invasive. So there are four common characteristics to invasive species. And the first is that they're generalists. So zebra mussels, they came all the way from Eastern Europe and Russia, and they're doing quite well in Minnesota, Canada, other states. Um, they were even able to survive in the ballast water of the ocean-going ships. That's how we think they got here. They, they, were, they were taken up in water in the Caspian Sea, put into the ballast tanks of these big ocean-going ships so they'd have better buoyancy crossing the ocean. They got into the Great Lakes, they emptied their ballast water, and those zebra mussels came out of that ballast water. We think that's how they got into the Great Lakes, and they spread from the Great Lakes into our inland lakes. But they're highly adaptable. Russia, Eastern Europe, living in ballast water on the way across the ocean, and then doing quite well in Minnesota and Canada. Um, they're aggressive, the second one. So zebra mussels and spiny water fleas, they eat the same food as young walleye, zooplankton, and they do it very well. So they, they compete with young walleye. Um, starry stonewort, if anybody's heard of starry stonewort, it's a macroalgae. We found it down in Stearns County a couple of years ago, and it's been found in about 10 other lakes around Minnesota. But it outcompetes the native vegetation. It grows very quickly up to the surface, and forms thick mats on the surface, which blocks out the sunlight down to the native plants, okay? So that's being very aggressive. The third one is that they reproduce rapidly and often. So one zebra mussel can produce 500,000 to a million young every year. And that's why we see these exponential increases in population when they, when they get into a lake. They really take off. No natural enemies. So they've come from these faraway places and we have no natural enemies for them. We have um, fish that will eat zebra mussels, bluegills will eat them, uh, ducks will eat them, but not enough to control the population. So that's why the population takes off. They don't have any natural checks and balances controls here. Species of concern. Mike's going to be passing around. I brought uh, some acrylic plates with actual samples of different invasive species. Some of them also have the native species in there, sometimes you can see it's hard to tell the difference between a, a northern water milfoil and a Eurasian water milfoil. I think some have zebra mussels in there, a few other things. But he's going to pass them around and feel free to pass them around. I think there's three smaller plates and three bigger plates, and I'm going to be counting those at the end of this. Um, 
so th these are kind of the things that people talk about all the time around Minnesota. Zebra mussels, Eurasian water milfoil, and then starry stonewort, which I mentioned, which was just found uh, back in 2015 in Lake Coronis down in Stearns County. Um, zebra mussels and Eurasian water milfoil uh, made their arrival in Minnesota back in the 80s. They've been around for a while. We're still trying to figure out how to control those things once they get into lakes. Um, Starry Stonewort is another one that was, it's brand new to Minnesota, all of a sudden it showed up. It had been over in Wisconsin, and then one day somebody found it over in Lake Coronas, and we figured it had been there for a while, and we've since found it in, I think, 10 other lakes. I think there are 11 lakes around Minnesota that have now been confirmed with Starry Stonewort. An interesting observation by the researchers is that a lot of these invasive species, back in their home range, they're very docile. They aren't aggressive. But when they get into a new environment, they all of a sudden become very aggressive. And they see that a lot with zebra mussels, Eurasian water milfoil, and starry stonewort. Starry stonewort is actually endangered right now in its home environment of Europe and Asia. Yet it, it's really taking off here in Minnesota. So they're in our lakes. They're in our rivers. They're in our toilets. Oh my gosh. They're in our toilets. This is a, a little story that I heard um, about uh, zebra mussels are over on, in Round Lake, just north of Brainerd. And uh, a few years ago, we had some bad wind storms that came through, knocked trees down, knocked power lines down. People were out of power. They still wanted to try and stay in their homes and use whatever they could. So folks from Round Lake were going down to the lake and grabbing buckets of water and bringing them up to the house and pouring the buckets of water into the tanks of their toilets so that they could still use the toilet and flush it. Well, after the power was restored and the water was able to run again, um, this person told me that they noticed that a toilet was, was leaking that wasn't leaking before. And they had somebody come and look at it. And what had happened was when they had taken buckets of water and poured them into the toilet tank, they had brought zebra mussels into there. And the zebra mussels had attached to the seals and had formed these little areas where water could leak out. So all of a sudden, we've got zebra mussels in the toilet. I think they ended up tossing the toilet away. But it's one of the, just one of the little stories that show you why we don't want to move this stuff around, why there are some really strict rules about moving invasive species around, because these are the kinds of things that can happen that you weren't planning on. So at this point, we'd like to take you from the, the bad news to the good news. All right, now that you're all discouraged, I think we need to rescue you back because there is hope. As Phil had mentioned, you know, these are all solvable problems. We, you know, they're large. They're global in many respects. But having said that, they're solvable. They're solvable through the actions of each and every one of us in this room and around. These are problems that generally have occurred as a result of um, the actions of millions of individuals accumulating over time, and it's the actions of millions of individuals that will bring us back from that. So what we'd like to kind of do at this point is adapt a little bit of another Dylan tune here. A hard rain's gonna fall. Oh, what did you see, my blue-eyed son? What did you see, my darling young one? I saw crops that were wilting for farmers' wells had gone dry And roads all washed away and dams that were bursting I saw a forest that was leveled by storm winds that blew I saw wildfires burning like the boiler of a freight train Saw moose that were dying from lack of a winter And lakes that were dying from too long a summer And it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's a hard rain It's gonna fall It's kind of depressing, wasn't it? <laughs> Alright, we'll bring you back now Dylan was really good at uh, giving us the, what we needed to hear and then calling us to action. So this is our attempt to do that as well. Oh, what do you do now, my blue-eyed son? Oh, 
What'll you do now, my darling young one? I'm going back out for the rain starts a falling. And I'll tell it, and I'll think it, and speak it, and breathe it. And reflect it from mountains so all souls can see it. That climate change is real, and it's happening now. And don't know it's not lost, for there's action I can take. So show me what to do, and I'll do what I can. Because it's hard, it's hard. It's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard rain. It's gonna fall. Thank you. So hopefully we've brought you back from the brink of despair. Is there anything we can do? It seems confusing, but there are some things we can do. So AIS and climate change are complex problems, but there are things that all of us, there are things that all of us can do to help. And much of what we can do, especially when we're talking about invasive species, depends on how much we're willing to change our behaviors and how much we're willing to be inconvenienced. This is a great quote. I love this quote by H.L. Mencken. For every complex problem, there is a simple solution, dot, 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 and it's wrong. There are some simple things we can do, but solving AIS is a very complex problem. And I hear people all the time say, oh, I know exactly how to solve AIS. All we have to do is X. And X could be everything from shutting down all public accesses to requiring decontamination and inspection every time you go in and out of a Minnesota lake. And those might work, but those, what you think is a simple solution, they bump up against the realities of life. They bump up against legalities. They bump up against social norms. They bump up against political influence. They bump up against economic realities. And it also bumps up against two simple facts. People don't like change, and people don't like to be inconvenienced. So ask yourself, when it comes to aquatic invasive species, how much am I willing to change? How much am I willing to be inconvenienced? Um, will you pull your plug? Now that was a new law that was created a few years ago about having people pull their plug so that boats would drain on, while they're transporting. And there was a bit of grumbling when it happened, but most folks seem to be doing that as part of their normal behavior now. Um, so it's trying to figure out what are those things that folks are willing to do and that they will do. Um, so we know how to solve the AIS problem, at least, at least the way that it moves around. Uh, but the hard part is getting the recreating public to accept change and inconvenience in exchange for AIS-free lakes. So where is that balance point that achieves the suspension of AIS movement that is willingly accepted and practiced by the public? So we've got laws here in Minnesota that require the voting public to do certain things. And we've got clean, drain, dispose. These are legal requirements. There are laws that back up each one of those. So clean aquatic plants and animals from your watercraft and water-related equipment. If you're caught driving down the road and you've got all sorts of plants hanging off your boat and your engine, your trailer, it doesn't even matter if they're invasive plants. You cannot have any plants whatsoever on your boat, motor, trailer driving down the road. If, a, if an enforcement officer or a local sheriff sees that, they can pull you over. Um, drain, this was that drain plug law that came into effect, I think, back in about 2015 or so. Um, drain all water by removing drain plugs and keep drain plugs out while transporting watercraft. Pull that, pull that plug. Drain any kind of water that's in the boat. You can't be moving water from one lake to another. Uh, it includes water in your live wells. It includes water in your bait bucket. It includes water in your bilge. We want that boat to be dry. And dispose, dispose of unwanted bait. So a lot of folks will go into a lake and fish. They'll take their bait, have it in a bait bucket, drop it into the water. Uh, they'll fish and they'll say, well, they're not biting really well here, but my friend tells me they're biting really well 
couple miles up the road, I'm going to go there. The rule is that you can keep that bait if you've brought water from home to replace the water that it was in. So you can't take the water out from that lake in your bait bucket, go all the way up to the next lake, and move that water. Some of the stuff that we're trying to keep from moving around is microscopic. You can't see it. Um, it's in the water, and so we don't want to move water. So if you don't have other water to change that bait for that bait, then you have to dispose of that bait in the trash. You can't move it. That's another law. Um, so the DNR and local government have put out about 1,000 watercraft inspectors around the state. In 2017, we were over 1,000 watercraft inspectors. And they did almost a, a half a million inspections in just 2017. And what they found was that about 97% of the people who show up at a public access with their boat, they're all doing the right things. Their plug is pulled. They don't have any plants or animals attached to the boat or trailer or engine. And the water is drained. It's, it's dry. Um, they're doing everything that they need to do, 97%. It's that 3% that still hasn't gotten the message that either is unaware that we've got some AIS laws that just chooses to ignore them, but there's about 3% out there that are not showing up doing everything they're supposed to. So what happened to clean, drain, dry? That's what we used to say before clean, drain, dispose came into play. And dry is still a great thing to do, but we don't have any laws that back that up. We have laws for clean, we have laws for drain, and we have laws for dispose of bait. We don't have a law that requires you to dry your boat um, so that it's completely dry. We want you to drain all water out of it, but we don't have laws that say you must keep your boat dry for five days before you move it from one lake to another. Drying is a great recommendation, and we recommend anytime you can dry your boat, your trailer, your gear before moving from one lake to another. That's a, a, that's a great thing to, to do, but it's a recommendation. We do have a law about dry when it comes to moving docks and boat lifts and swim rafts and other kinds of water-related equipment. That if you want to move a dock or a boat lift or a swim raft from your lake to another lake, there is a requirement that you have to leave it out of the water for 21 days before it can be dropped in that other lake. How many of, how many of you out there, show of hands, knew that that was a law? Yeah, and that's one of the problems, is that we think a lot of this stuff is moving around by docks, boat lifts that are being sold through places like Craigslist, where you get a buyer, a seller, hey, I've got a boat, uh, dock lift over here on Gull, and I want to sell it to somebody who's on uh, another lake. And they come, they pick it up, they take it, they drop it into their lake, and they've just moved zebra mussels. So we're trying to get the word out about this, this law that you have to keep it dry. What we can do, is if we're aware of this, is maybe pull our, when we pull our docks in the winter, uh, in the fall, let it sit through the winter and then sell it in the spring. Or if you're going to sell your boat or your dock lift, or your boat, boat lift or your dock, or some other piece of water-related equipment, pull it out of the water and let it sit at your place for 21 days before you sell it so that we aren't worried about whether the guy who's buying it knows what the rule is. So it's not just boats, trailers, docks, and boat lifts that are moving this stuff around. There are a lot of other ways this can move around. Um, canoes and kayaks. Mike and I have done a number of, of trips up to the Boundary Waters and the Quetico, and you take all your gear and your canoe, and you, you pop it into a lake, and you paddle across the lake, and then you come to a portage, and you pull everything out and you hike it all over, over the portage over to the next lake and you drop it back that, everything back down into that lake. And you can do as many as eight or 10 portages in a day depending how far you wanna go. And Mike and I have often caught ourselves where we'll drop it into the next lake and we'll start paddling out. We'll get about 15 paddles into the lake and Mike will say, Bill, did you check the boat to make sure we didn't have any water left in it or that we didn't have any plants left on it before we dropped it in? And my response is usually, well, I was dying just from that portage. I didn't have enough, I didn't have enough energy to check and see if the water. So here's Mike and me, we're professionals. We, we deal with this stuff five days a week at work, six days when we're doing presentations like this, and even we forget to do it. Um, so it's a reminder that you, know, you, you have to think about this stuff. It has to become part of your normal behavior. Um, also, uh, dive gear. Um, we see a scuba diver there. Uh, 
Invasive species have been found in some of the mine pit lakes over near Crosby. And some of those mine pit lakes do not have accesses that allow boats to trailer in and get in there. So they're being moved in there some other way, and they're very popular with divers, and there's a suspicion that maybe some divers moved, moved it in. So you have to make sure that your dive equipment is clean and dry before you pop it in there. Um, fishing gear, spiny water flea uh, are potentially moved around on fishing gear. When you're fishing, they'll attach to the fishing lines. They look like these globs of jello. Um, and if you decide, oh, the fishing isn't very good here, I'm gonna run over to a different lake real quick. And if you've moved over without cleaning your gear and you drop that fishing line in, you've just moved spiny water flea. Um, so that's another way to move it. Uh, anchor lines, this is one that people often don't think about, anchor lines. Anchor lines, you drop it into the water, you hook onto the bottom, find a nice fishing spot, and you uh, uh, finish up your fishing and you pull your anchor line in, you throw it into that little compartment for your anchor and line. And many of us don't even look at that. We, do we clean off, the, do we clean off the, any plants that are attached, any dirt? There might be some plants with zebra mussels attached to those plants. So we need to make sure that every time we pull that anchor up, we check it to make sure it's clean. And before we drop it back down into the next spot, we make sure it's clean. Because sometimes when it's put into that water locker, there's a little bit of water in there, it stays nice and humid. A lot of these invasive species need that little bit of water, a little bit of humidity. But if we can get it dry and get that stuff off of there, it will really help from moving this stuff around. Uh, duck hunting equipment. Any duck hunters in here? A few? Um, do you drain the water from your decoys? Do you check your, your waders before you move from one slough to another? We, that, this is ways that it can be moved around. Anything that goes in water and comes out of water is a potential way to move this stuff around. Um, how many of you, by a show of hands, think it's the ducks and turtles moving this stuff around? It's the animals that are moving it. I, we hear that a lot. Now they might be, but there's no evidence that shows that that is actually happening. Um, Wisconsin did a really interesting study where they looked at lakes where there was human activity and lakes where there was no human activity, and the only places where they found invasive species were those lakes with human activity. Animals do a pretty good job of keeping themselves clean. Um, they may be moving around, but again, we have no scientific evidence that shows that's happening. What, there's a saying that this stuff is being moved around by high, highways, not flyways. So it's, it's humans that are moving it. How many of you um, hire a company to come in and pull your dock out in the fall and put it in in the spring? A show of hands, anybody? We've got a few. Um, I know that you know, we've got a lot of these services out there. These lake service providers, they're required to go through a, an AIS training with the DNR to be certified. So they have to understand about AIS and they have to be certified um, before they can, can do this kind of work. And uh, um, just wondering if, if you've ever questioned your, your lake service provider about their training. You know, have a conversation with them. You know, are they, are they into the training that they got? Do they, do they, are they trying to do things that are a little bit better management style? Like when they're putting docks in or pulling docks out, do they first work on the, the water bodies that are listed as not infested and then go to the infested waters, save the infested waters for the end of the day so that we're not moving stuff around? Or some of these lake service providers will have uh, different equipment that they'll use for zebra mussel infested waters. They'll have a completely separate piece of equipment that they'll use. You know, talk to them about that. What, what kinds of best management practices are they doing? Are they, are they doing it because they were told they have to, or are they doing it because they wanna make sure that this stuff doesn't move around? So hire good help. So what about other invasive species heading our way? So up in the top left corner, we've got a zebra mussel up on the very top, and it's a quagga mussel next to it. Um, quagga mussels are said to be even more aggressive than zebra mussels. That when you've got the two of them, the quagga mussels outcompete the zebra mussels. Quagga mussels have been found in Lake Superior, but they're not in any in, in inland lakes here in Minnesota yet. They're in some of the western states, uh, but they haven't made it into the inland lakes in Minnesota. We haven't found any yet. Um, hydrilla, over on the right, um, that's harvesting hydrilla in Florida. Um, hydrilla is an invasive plant that's slowly making its way north and west from the southeastern U.S. 
Um, its first appearance in Florida, they figure, was probably someone dumping the contents of an aquarium. And it's gone from something dumping the contents of an aquarium into a water body to millions and millions of dollars that the state of Florida has to put out to try and control this stuff, uh, harvest it, chemically treat it, and it still comes back. It, it clogs up waterways um, just from dumping of an aquarium. Um, snakehead, bottom right, a lot of teeth. Uh, Northern snakehead, it's sometimes called frankenfish <laughs> because there was a B movie that was made a few years ago about a giant snakehead fish eating really bad actors. <laughs> um, they're voracious eaters of fish, mollusks, and frogs, and they can survive out of water for up to four days if they're kept wet. Um, they breed four to five times a year. And juveniles have been known to travel up to a quarter of a mile by wriggling their bodies over the land. That's why it's called a frankenfish. We don't want them here. Um, VHS, viral hemorrhagic septicemia, is a disease that fish get. Um, it's already in Lake Superior, um, but it has not been found in any of the inland lakes, and we want to we keep it that way. It, it kills our game fish. Um, so how can we keep this stuff from, from coming into Minnesota and moving around our lakes in Minnesota? Same thing, inspect, clean, drain, dry if possible, dispose of your bait. And this will not only keep stuff that we already have from moving around, but it will keep any new stuff that potentially comes here from moving around as well. Thank you, Phil. And so some of the things that we can say for certain on these big issues like climate change is that the future holds for us something different than we know today. And we'll need to adapt to a changing future, but that isn't a reason to be complacent. And so, uh, speaking of complacency, it's time for another test. So, my good friends, how many think we should fund research into renewable energy? Show of hands, please. Wow. And, like the rest of the country, very, very strongly believe that we should be funding research into new, renewable energy sources. How many of you think carbon dioxide, CO2, should be regulated as a pollutant? There's a slight majority in the room here about that, and this is something, again, that there's a fair amount of consensus in the public opinion that we should be regulating carbon dioxide. As a, as a pollutant. So some interesting facts from ourselves here in this room and also nationwide. So to the topic of, um, of energy and carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is fairly closely linked to energy production. And this is sort of a pie chart, if you would, of how energy gas emissions, heat trapping gas emissions, in other words, carbon dioxide, are you know, basically partitioned out amongst the various potential sources. Um, there's an interesting fact, a couple of interesting statistics that I got from the United States Green Building Council. We're in a building. Our homes are a building, right? Buildings account for 39% of the energy use in the United States. Pretty pretty alarming amount of that. We would think uh, uh, perhaps other uh, things might also contribute to significant, more significantly, but energy use on buildings. 72% of electrical consumption is by buildings. Not lighting, street lights and things like that, but buildings. 38% of our carbon dioxide emissions are from buildings. We can begin to see our connections to things that we can do because we Many of us live in buildings, if not all of us. Right? So we have some control here over some of the things that we can do. And interestingly, you can, uh, you know, half of this, these statistics that I'm giving you are from residential buildings. So half of it are from our homes. So we could take a significant bite, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood to 25 to 50 percent just by using green building practices. Good energy uh, uh, sealing, weather sealing, high efficiency appliances, um, Green Star kinds of uh, appliances and things to that effect. So we have control over those sorts of things. 
as, as homeowners, as renters, as, as people that reside in buildings. Um, so really returning back to sort of the opening theme, we know what to do. We just need to do it. When you think about something as large as an atmospheric problem that goes across the globe, it seems overwhelming. But friends and neighbors, I can assure you this is a solvable problem because we have evidence it's a solvable problem. Folks remember uh, the, the subject of the ozone hole over the Antarctic? Did folks remember that topic? Yeah. You know, this was all in the news in the, in the 90s, the 80s and 90s, where these refrigerant compounds we use in our air conditioning such are, are called chlorinated fluorocarbons, CFCs, were being uh, released into the atmosphere. They were also used as propellant for hairspray and underarm and everything else that we used to project things out of cans. Um, and what was happening is this stuff was eroding ozone in the atmosphere and accumulating very quickly. This was a problem that originated in the 1970s to the point where ozone layer, which protects us from ultraviolet radiation from the sun, was being eroded and, and, uh, and, and reduced in the atmosphere, creating fairly unsafe conditions in certain parts. Globally, we took action. Right? The Montreal Protocols, I believe 1986, the, the, in, the, you know, the nations across the, the globe agreed to stop the production and use of CFCs, and we're seeing the erosion of the ozone hole, ozone in, in the Antarctic has leveled out. And projections are that by 2075, within the lifetime of some of us in this room, we will be back to those pre-1980 levels. That's huge. That's an atmospheric problem across the globe, and we're seeing the needle move. And you can do the same thing through some of these very simple actions. Again, we talked about actions by millions got us where we're at, and actions by millions can get us to a more, you know, a, a, a less grim future, a more optimistic future. The Bob Dylan song that we did, you know, talk about it. Talk about it with your neighbors. Talk about it with your family. Talk about it in your communities. Hold your elected officials accountable. You know, those charts we just showed about whether we should fund renewable energy, whether we should regulate carbon dioxide as a pollutant, um, there's a lot of consensus that we should do those things. That consensus is not shared in, in Congress. Um, but don't wait for public policy. There are things that you can do, right? We can insulate our homes better. If you're looking to do a remodeling project in your home, great opportunity to be able to upgrade some of your insulation of your home. Energy efficient light bulbs. Anyone know what an LED light bulb is? Yeah, these things used to be really spendy, and now they're very, very affordable. They use a very low amount of electricity, and again, thinking about our homes creating or consuming half of that energy consumption of buildings, why just a simple thing like just changing out of light bulbs can make a significant dent in that. It's very easy to do, very affordable. There's nothing really to hold us back. Appliances, you know, Energy Star appliances, high efficiency. Some of us might be able to take advantage of uh, solar energy through either electrical generation or heat production from solar. Um, and we have great examples here in this community of, of, of leadership in developing some of these alternative energy sources. Transportation, I want, I'm proud to say that my colleague Phil has zero carbon credits getting himself here today. We rode together, so I drove. That's not usually the case. Mike is usually trying to lower his carbon footprint by hitching rides with his friends. Yeah, some might call, call it bumming rides, but hey, uh, <laughs> why, why quibble? <laughs> but we have these high, high fuel efficient vehicles being produced today, right? Where we're getting up to 50 miles per gallon. I, I just, you know, bought a used car a few years ago, upgrading and rolling something out. I don't have a 50 mile per gallon car, but the car that I replaced, uh, or that, I, that I brought into my, my ownership, I turned out another vehicle. I've increased the fuel efficiency of my vehicle by 
just by that. So even these increments, you know, if you have the ability and the opportunity to buy some of these super high mileage vehicles, do it. But, you know, there are cars on the market that would, right now, that would increase our fuel efficiency by, by 50%. That's pretty good. Um, using public transportation, that's tough for us to do in these rural areas, but ride sharing is not tough for us to do, right? Or using teleconferencing technology now to be able to communicate differently than being physically present at a meeting is really made a lot. That's things that we do at the DNR quite a bit. So we've, we've, got, we've invested in high, high fuel efficiency vehicles. We teleconference a lot now using video conferencing and things like that to, to say, let's not do this. We've upgraded the fuel or the energy efficiency of our buildings. So our agency is very committed to this, uh, this uh, topic and these, these very solutions. Increasing efficiency in energy, alternative sources such as wind and power. And you have great examples across, across the highway here of that. And, and there are some other things here that can be done in the agricultural setting. So uh, you can do this. We can do this. This is a solvable problem. We just need to do it. So Phil. Just wrapping up here. Um, so it's always good to end on a positive note. And this is a, a quote from Helen Keller. And I always figured if Helen Keller could be optimistic, we have no reason to complain. Um, truth is, we have much to be optimistic about when we're talking about invasive species. Um, most Minnesota lakes are not infested with aquatic invasive species. Um, there's a feeling that it's everywhere, and it isn't. 97% um, of the people are showing up in public access is doing everything that they need to do to put a clean boat into the water. And, and notice that I said 97% are doing the right thing. I didn't say 3% still haven't got it. We're trying to sort of put a positive spin on things and create social norms. When you talk about the positive, people want to be part of that positive. When they hear that there's a negative happening, they think, well, I'm not doing that either. That's okay. There's 3% else that are they're still doing it. So we're trying to create positive social norms. Um, another positive thing, we have the University of Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center, a state-of-the-art research center right here in Minnesota. It started about five years ago. They got funding through the legislature and through the LCCMR. Uh, and they're doing some great stuff down there. They've been mapping the zebra mussel genome to try and figure out where are the weaknesses for this thing? What can we attack that won't kill off everything else in the lake? Uh, another positive, something to be optimistic about. We have $10 million going out to the counties right now from the legislature. The legislature decided that aquatic invasive species is important enough that we're going to pull money out of the general fund $10 million every year. It started in 2014. And we're going to spread it out amongst the counties. And the counties can d use this money however they deem appropriate, as long as it's dealing with aquatic invasive species prevention. Uh, a lot of the counties up in this region do quite well. It's based on the number of public trailer launches in each county, as well as the number of parking spaces at those trailer launches. So Crow Wing, Cass, Aiken, St. Louis County, um, they're all doing very well. We've got a lot of public accesses, so we get a lot of money. Cass, I think, gets about $500,000 a year. Um, Crow Wing, about $440,000 a year. St. Louis County, which, gets the, which has the, the most uh, um, accesses plus parking spaces, they get close to $700,000 a year um, to put towards AIS prevention work. And we are the rock stars in the AIS world. Other states are so jealous that we have this $10 million that's going out to each of the counties to figure out how to deal with invasive species in their own county. Local control. Plus, we have people like Mike and me working on this stuff. That's something to be optimistic about. <laughs> so there, there are reasons to be optimistic. I, I, I like to tell a, a little story about my, my younger sister, Judy, who at 39 years old, she got cancer, got breast cancer. And she fought it for six tough years as it spread throughout her body. And she always kept this great attitude. And I used to say to her, Judy, how can you have such a great attitude? And she, said, she would say, well, I can either be a pain in the ass or I can have a good attitude. Either way, I'm going to have cancer. And who wants to hang around a pain in the ass with cancer? So we've got invasive species. We've got climate change going on. But let's not lose our optimism, okay?
we need to remain optimistic about this stuff. We've got a lot of people working on these things. We've got a lot of folks like you out there making changes in your own lives. This is really important stuff. Let's be optimistic about the future. Um, maybe another song can help. I know Quinn quite tried to get these three bands, but they weren't available. <laughs> so she asked us if we could play. Um, the last song that we're going to do uh, is actually Bob Dylan had nothing to do with it. Um, we love Bob Dylan, but we also like other stuff. And this, this song is a, actually a song that I wrote. Um, I took an old blues tune and put some new words to it. And uh, I call it the Invasive Species Blues. Lubrication. Okay, we got the right harmonica? I think so. to see invasive species spread around oh I hate to see invasive species in my town and oh it makes me blue it really brings me down and if I feel tomorrow like I'm feeling today Oh, if I feel tomorrow as blue as I'm feeling today, I'm gonna box me up some zebra mussels and send them back to their homes far away. Yeah, they should be over in Russia and Eastern Europe too. But like me, they moved to my lake. What's a Minnesotan to do? Now they're living on my Chris Craft And on the poles of my docks To swim I have to wear sneakers And I do but with black socks Because that rocks I got the invasive species blues Just as blue as I can be Now Mr. Zebra Muscle's thrown a beach party And he's invited Mr. Spiny Water Flea these good-for-nothing invasive species are making fools out of you and me. Take a mic. All is not lost, I'm told there's plenty we can do. Oh, all is not lost, I'm told it's up to me and you. So my brain has started working to come up with an idea or two. You see, I'm gonna hit every McDonald's between Maine and Washington. Yeah, I've got a plan to get something done. I'm gonna ask them to slip a zebra mussel between every beef patty and sesame seed bun. Yeah, billions will be served and they won't even know. We'll just hide the taste of more ketchup and people will eat our worthy foe. Happy meals might not be so happy, but into the box we can fit a slightly bigger toy to thank them for eating an invertebrate and a little bit of grit. I no longer have the blues, now I just want to sing. 
I've come up with an idea that is brilliant and interesting. And if I crave a fast food burger, I'll just go to Burger King. Thank you so very much, folks. So, Quinn, did we want to take any questions or do you want to move things around? Are there questions? It's like, well, sure. For those of you that didn't hear the question, um, there was a question about can't we have sort of a, a different color assigned to whichever lake you live on? If you're in a non infested water, then you ought to be able to move in and out of those non-infested waters. If you're in infested water, you ought to be able to just stay on those infested waters and not go into those non-infested waters. That's been discussed um, in the past. The problem is some of these waters that we don't think are infested, we just don't know yet. Um, there might be some things in there, and if we say that, well, this is A-OK, -okay, you can move in and out of this to wherever you want, we don't know for sure that there's not infested it, with AIS in there, that there might be young zebra mussel villagers in there that we just haven't found yet. Um, also, it's, it's the administrative part of trying to figure out how that all works. And you had said that, that it's the folks who live on one lake and don't move, they're not really the problem. What they found is that folks who live on one lake and maybe only move one or two times in a year often qualify themselves as, well, I don't move my boat around. They maybe move it once and they think that they're not the problem, but you, we have to be careful with all of it. Did you have anything to say about that? I don't, thank you. Well, uh, so, might have been a little stick around. Yep, uh, we can take questions questions. afterwards. Okay. Um, but before we totally wrap up, we have some prize calls yeah. Oh, wow. Oh. Pie! <laughs> pie, get out of the way! <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You ready? <laughs> <laughs> thank you.